So next we're going to talk about movement and how your body engages in the various movements you complete each day. Your brain is linked to the concept of doing something, which is what we call movement. It's an internal process that's going to be useless without the ability to um, interact. So just having a thought about something is not going to matter if you can't actually engage in it. So your muscles are fibers that exist in your body. All animals have movement depending on muscle contractions. You have smooth muscles, skeletal muscles, or what's called striated muscles, same thing, and cardiac muscles. Your smooth muscles are going to control your digestive system and other organs. Your skeletal or scot um, striated muscles are going to control the movement of your body in relation to the environment. And your cardiac muscles, of course, cardiac controls your heart and the skeletal and smooth muscles. Your muscles are composed of many individual fibers. Those fibers receive information from an axon and send that information into your muscle fibers. Neuro, a neuromuscular junction is the synapse that exists between a motor neuron and a muscle fiber. It releases acetylcholine, which causes your muscles to contract and react to each other. An antagonistic muscle is um, a movement that requires alternating contractions of the opposite muscles. Acetylcholine always excites skeletal muscles to contract, whereas a flexor muscle is um, the one that flexes and raises an appendage. An extender muscle is one that extends an appendage or straightens it. So extender, extensor is going to extend, a flexor is going to flex, and acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that's going to help them contract. Your muscles can move in fast or slow movements. Your skeletal muscles are fast twitches when those fibers produce fast contractions. And when that happens, your muscles can get very fatigued quickly. Slow twi twitches are fibers that uh, produce those rigorous contractions, but without the fatigue associated with it. So your muscles can continue to go. People are all going to have varying percentages of fast and slow twitch muscles. Those slow twitch fibers are aerobic in nature and require oxygen during movement and they don't fatigue. So think about when you're working out, that's when those slow twitches are happening. Non-strenuous activities also can utilize slow twitches and intermediate fibers. Those fast twitch muscles or fibers are anaerobic. And they don't require oxygen, which is what results in fatigue. Any behavior that requires quick movements are going to um, require those fast twitches. For muscle control, you have proprioceptors who, that detect the position or movement of different parts of the body. You've got muscle spindles. If you can look at the chart and see those mus muscle, muscle spindles here, they are going to cause contraction of the muscles. You also have stretch um, reflux, which occurs when those proprioceptors detect the stretch and tension of a muscle and send that information to the spinal cord. The Golgi tendon is an organ um, of another type of proprioceptor that responds to increases in muscle tension. It's in your tendons and it acts as a break to stop things that don't need to occur. You have voluntary and involuntary movements in your body. Your reflexes are involuntary, consistent and automatic movements. Most movements are a combination of voluntary and involuntary. Um, your movements can vary with respect to feedback. Some are guided by feedback and some are ballistic and cannot be changed once it's been 
um, initiated. So you, we all have voluntary and involuntary movements in our body, and we all can respond differently depending on the situation we're in. When it comes to your behaviors, your behaviors are consistent and rapid sequences of movement. Your central pattern generators are the neural uh, mechanisms that exist in your spinal cord that help generate rhythmic patterns for motor output. A motor uh, program is the sequence of movements that is either learned or built into the nervous system. Once it's started, that sequence continues to stay the same. So yawning, a mouse grooming itself, those are all motor, um, the motor program that helps um, movements occur. The cerebral cortex, um, it consists of the primary motor cortex, which is located in the pre-central gyrus in the frontal lobe. So here we've got our primary motor cortex here. Axons from the pre-central um, gyrus connect to the brain stem of the spinal cord here and that generates your muscles um, to contract and it's involved in complex movements so when a movement in your body is planned overlap can exist so your primary motor cortex is going to be responsible for those motor movements and it's active when people are intending to have, engage in movement. It orders an outcome to occur and the posterior parietal cortex will help keep track of those positions of um, movement in relation to where the person is in the world so that they don't um, engage in anything that could be harmful. If there's damage to the posterior parietal cortex, um, it could provide difficulty in coordinating visual stimuli with the environment. So you may not be able to see what it is you're trying to do. So in order to plan a movement, that posterior parietal cortex has to be involved. The premotor cortex is also involved in your movement. It's active during the preparation from the movement. It's going to help receive the information that's targeted and help the body integrate that information so that the movement can take place. The supplementary motor cortex helps organize your sequence of movements so that they go in a specific order so that you don't um, engage in the wrong movement at the wrong time. It's active for a few seconds before a movement and can help inhibit in correction movements if they are to happen in the future. The prefrontal cortex is active whenever a movement has been delayed. It's going to help you store that sensory information so you'll know the next time this movement needs to occur, this is what I need to do. Mirror neurons are neurons that exist in your brain that help you prepare for movement especially after you've watched somebody else perform the same or a similar movement. It helps us know how people can empathize with others and also helps us understand social uh -oh, behaviors. We know that your spinal cord helps send messages to your brain. The messages the brain receives has to reach, reach the medulla and the spinal cord in order to control your muscles. Because remember, the medulla is important for some of our primary functions like breathing and stuff of that nature. That communication that happens between the brain and spinal cord can happen through the lateral corticospinal tract or the medial corticospinal tract. The lateral corticospinal tract is the set of axons from the primary motor cortex which surrounds areas and um, sends messages to the spinal cord. It controls movements in the peripheral areas like your hands and feet. And in the red nucleus, it's a, it's a part of the midbrain that will help your arm muscles move. 
Those axons are able to extend from one side of the brain to the opposite side of the spinal cord so that it controls the opposite side of the body. Because remember, according to brain lateralization, your right brain is con controlling your left body movements and your left brain is controlling your right body movements. The medial cortical spinal tract is a set of neurons that are axons that are responsible for parts of your cortex, um, like the reticular formation. Um, this um, is also part of your vestibular system that helps your body know when to move. So it controls your neck, shoulders, and trunk. That will help you do things like walk, turn, bend, stand, sit down. Here are some disorders that can exist in the spinal cord and all of, if any of these disorders exist, then it's going to involve difficulties with movement. Um, we know that quadriplegia or tetraplegia is the loss of sensation and voluntary muscle control in your arms and legs. It's because of a cut that exists in the spinal cord and can reach the neck and cause damage. There are also various other um, disorders that can exist in, as well, but they're all going to be disorders related to movement. The cerebellum is the part of the brain associated with balance and coordination. Neurons in the cerebellum need to communicate with all other parts of the brain. So if a person's cerebellum is damaged, it can cause trouble with rapid movements and timing or how a person is trying to aim. So they might have difficulty clapping, speaking, writing, or anything else related to um, coordination. They may not be able to keep a beat. It's important um, to have an intact cerebellum uh, for task, um, any task requiring timing and attention. Your cerebellum responds to sensory information, um, especially if there's the absence of movement. It's going to respond strongly to that sensory information and help you maintain attention. The cerebellum is organized um, to receive input from your spinal cord and to and your sensory um, muscles as well. And um, the cerebral cortex is the surface of the cerebellum. The cerebral cortex neurons are arranged in a way of geometric patterns, and that is gonna help um, with output and well-controlled duration. You have Purkinje cells, which are flat, parallel cells in sequential planes. You can see those here. And then you also have parallel fibers, like these yellow fibers. There are axons that are parallel to one another and perpendicular to planes of Purkinje cells. The greater the number of excited Purkinje cells, the greater their collective duration and response. We can see that Purkinje per cells transmit inhibitory messages to the cells in the cerebellum and the vestibular. Those messages that could be sent um, um, are then sent to the midbrain and the thalamus for processing. The basal ganglia is a group of large subcortical structures in the forebrain. It's responsible for initiating an action that's not guided by a stimulus. It can include the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pedilus. The basal ganglia, ganglia um, again, has those three parts. The caudate nucleus and the putamen are responsible for receiving information from your cerebral cortex and sending it on to um, the globus pollutus, which connects to the thalamus to relay that information to the prefrontal cortex. By having the information in the prefrontal cortex, your brain then knows what it should do with it, how it should move. Whenever a person needs to learn a new skill, they have to use multiple parts of their brain in order to control their movement. So learning a new dance or something like that would require multiple brain areas being involved. The basal ganglia, 
is critical for learning those motor, motor skills and organizing it so that those automatic behaviors and new habits can occur. Another example besides learning a new dance would be driving a new car. It's a pattern of activities that exist in the neurons that have to be more consistent when a new skill is involved. When it comes to your decision makings, conscious decisions to move and the movement that occurs itself occur at different times. There's something called the readiness potential, which is activity in the motor cortex that occurs before any type of movement happens. It begins at about 200 milliseconds before the movement, and it implies that we become conscious of a decision to move after the process has already begun. So the process happens and then we become aware of it and then our timing starts. Parkinson's disease is a brain disorder um, as well as Huntington's disease um, that affects a person's movement. It can impact their mood, their memory, and also their cognition. Par Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder that can involve muscle tremors, slow, slow movements, difficulty initiating a physical or mental activity. It can also lead to depression, memory and reason deficits, loss of olfaction, and other cognitive issues as well. It's caused by a gradual and progressive death of neurons in the substantia nigra. That is what sends those dopamine releasing axons to the caudic lupulus and the putamen to tell your brain how to move. So that's what slows the, the movements. Other causes of Parkinson's disease are um, genetics. Um, also, it could be environmental things as such as being um, around toxins and um, insecticides, herbicides, things like that. Um, traumatic head injury, cigarette smoking, or having some type of damage mitochondria cells can also impact the development of the disorder. The primary way that Parkinson's disease is treated is through a, a drug called L-DOPA, which is a pre precursor to dopamine to help in um, dopamine easily cross the blood brain barrier. It can be ineffective if a person is in late stages of the disorder, and it's not going to prevent um, the loss of neurons. It's just only going to help dopamine cross the blood brain barrier so that movements can happen more fluidly. Drugs that directly stimulate those dopamine receptors can be used to treat Parkinson's disease or implanting electrodes um, to also simulate those brain areas could also work. There are also a number of experimental strategies that many researchers have used, such as transplanting uh, brain tissues from aborted fetuses or implanting stem cells as well. Hunt Huntington's disease is a neurological condition that can also have motor symptoms, usually affects one in 10,000 people. Its onset is usually between 30, age 30, and 50. It has to do with a brain damage in the basal ganglia and the cerebral cortex. So it can start with jerky muscle movements and facial twitches and pro progress to tremors and difficulty walking with speech and other voluntary movements. So oftentimes people with Huntington's disease end up in a wheelchair. Um, it can lead to depression, memory impairment, anxiety, delusions, hallucinations, poor judgment, alcoholism, drug abuse, and sexual disorders. So if you take a look at this, um, these images of a brain on the left side, this is the brain of a normal person. Over here on the right side is the brain of a person with Huntington's disease. So you can see how this is much cleaner than this. We do also know that heredity plays a role in the development of Huntington's disease. So we have some presynaptic tests that can help identify whether or not somebody will develop Huntington's disease. And many people who have had family members who develop the disease will often get tested so that they will know if they are susceptible to it because many people 
don't want to have children if they know that that could be a possible outcome. It's controlled by uh, the dominant dream gene, which is on chromosome four. There are a variety of different uh, neurological diseases that are very similar um, to the CAG um, repeat, um, repeating in various genes. And there's lots of different ways to test for that. And the earlier the onset, the greater the probability of stronger genetic influence. So the sooner it occurs, the more likely it will happen in the future. And that is everything you need to know about movement.